Michael Gorian. Gorian, this presentation shows how it can be done and how we can move forward. Um, I would just like to look at the theme of um, the Dan's mentioned UK research frameworks. I'd just like to think about how we might extend those to Europe and, and in fact, beyond um, uh, on a worldwide canvas. And uh, my first slide is chosen for deliberate reason because it's a picture of Slater's Mill in Portucket, which was built in the 18th century by Samuel Slater. Um, Slater, the traitor, he's called him Belper because he used to work at Belper Mill in the uh, Derwood Valley and sneaked across to America and established a mill which copied exactly the technology used in Arkwright's mills in the Derwent Valley. A better example of technology transfer or industrial espionage, whatever you like to call it, you will not find. And the um, point is, if you want to understand the development of the Industrial Revolution in America, we cannot explain it without reference to England, and in particular the, the Derwent Valley, and more specifically, Belper. So, Belper's claim to fame. Um, This reinforces a point made by, by Dan. Um, we have a variety of research frameworks in the UK. And I'll just show you a sample. So top left, we have um, an example of a topic-specific research framework. Um, in this case, specifically prehistoric ceramics, both on the agenda and the strategy. Top right, we have some examples of regional research frameworks as the East Midlands Historic Environment Research Framework, and that is uh, an eclectic framework within all at all aspects of the historic environment. Um, we have sub-regional frameworks, and we show that the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site Research Framework. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the Derwent Valley Mills, it's just here, in the middle of the UK. Um, and one of the, uh, um, the, one of the one of the many cradles of the Industrial Revolution. Um, we also have period-specific research frameworks. Bottom left shows the Mesolithic framework, which is um, a digital framework, um, which can be um, which, which has been developed at the University of York. Um, and we also have some national frameworks, if we divide Britain up into England, Scotland and Wales. Both, England, both Scotland and Wales have national research frameworks. England doesn't. It's starting from the, the bottom up, whereas in Wales and Scotland, they started from the top down. Uh, and perhaps the most interesting of the lot, actually, is this one here. It's the North Sea Prehistory Research and Management Framework. And I like to think it leads the way because it's a research framework developed in England, um, which crossed um, the borders between England, the Netherlands, and Belgium. A series of key themes which can only be understood by looking at either side of the continent. And I'll come on to that, some of those themes in a moment. Um, many of the UK frameworks um, emphasise the wider European context, and I'll give you one example, um, which is the Prehistoric Ceramics Research Group Research Framework. That's top right. Um, one of the key themes is the organisation of production, distribution, and exchange. And, with, and, and the purpose of that is to one of the key purposes of that is to explore the ceramic interactions with the continent in earlier and later prehistory. And it poses a number of key questions, and, and I've shown included several here. So questions such as how can imported vessels help to define links within Britain and with continental Europe? For example, the earliest Neolithic pottery, Beaker pottery, late Bronze Age to early Iron Age pottery. Is imported pottery com Important body common in a particular area or period. How does the varying occurrence of imported pottery relate to the changing intensity of contact between places over time? What are the social and economic mechanisms underlying the importation of pots? Difficult, needless to say. And finally, how does the distribution, trade, or exchange of pottery differ regionally? Um, all of these issues require research across national boundaries, and perhaps the classic example is. It has a day all to itself in this conference, unfortunately it clashes with this particular session, is beaker pottery. And, and in particular the implication of DNA in terms of movement of people, perhaps, rather than just pots, or most likely both. And it's created quite a splash DNA analysis. Um, that's in British Archaeology, which shows the um, spur beaker pottery from possibly an Iberian heart so it's quite appropriate for a Barcelona-based Barcelona -based <coughs> conference. 
and be able to explain the examples of beakers. Okay, then my next example, before I end with a few concluding suggestions, is, is, is comes back to the Derwent Valley Mills. Because um, the textile industry in the Derwent Valley um, revolutionised mill design in the um, early to the mid 18th century. It also revolutionised working practices across Europe uh, and the world. Um, textile factories in, in many countries of Europe, such as France, Belgium, Germany, Austria, and Russia were all based upon the Arkwright model that was developed in the Derwent Valley. Um, and we can see close links between sites such as Cromford Mills in the Derwent Valley and Rattingen in Germany, or between um, the Belper Mills and Portucket, which I mentioned in my opening slide. Um, and uh, all these issues raise serious potential for creating joined up research frameworks which join up the, the whole issue of industrialization in the UK, continental mainland and America, and also the Far East, as I'll come on to shortly. A um, couple of slides um, just to illustrate those themes. Um, bottom left, you have Cromford Mill, um, built by Sir Richard Arkwright in 1771, uh, from 1790 to 1790. Um, and that technology was transferred to Cromford, another site called Cromford, what a surprise, in Rattingen, in Germany. And uh, not only um, was the name transferred, but also the technology by a variety of other underhand and uh, sneaky methods. Um, and um, that was by Joseph Brugelmann, who began production in 1784. So a great example of the connection between Germany and, and, and England. Um, and the Belper Mills I mentioned, and here you see the North and East Mills, North Mill 1804, East 1912, and then you see the Slater Mill in, uh, in New England, which was um, the whole, and that, as I've mentioned before, the technology was brought to the Eastern Seaboard by uh, School migrants such as Samuel Slater and Thomas Marshall. Um, but we can go further than that and we can look at worldwide connections in the Derwent Valley. Um, it's a bit of a controversial subject, but um, the, uh, the, the wealth of the Derwent Valley was based upon the cotton, which was um, grown in plantations principally in the New World, but, but also elsewhere, and employed slave labour. Um, and um, as you can see, we have quite a lot of documentary evidence for the, that practice. There are records in the Derbyshire Record Office, for example, which give precise details of the tonnages of cotton that were produced in uh, South America, Central America, and, um, and the southern states of the, of the USA. And great opportunity there for looking at trading connections between these areas and the relationship between Britain and the slave trade, etc., etc. So lots of international themes which can be addressed by reference to the documentary evidence surviving in, in the mills of the UK. Um, so the bottom one on the bottom left shows the origins of the raw cotton supplies of the Strutt mills between 1793 and 1798. And that's based on cotton weight data which has kind of miraculously survived in, uh, in, the, in, in the Derbyshire Record Office. Um, but just to make the point that we could extend our, 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 our interest even further, um, there are also links between um, cotton production in, uh, in India too. And um, there have been a variety of projects which have been looking at the links between um, um, Indian communities in uh, in the UK and the cotton industry, what are their responses to visiting the Arkwright Mills? Very different to ours, I suspect. So um, this is one of the products, products of one of these projects, which is a series of poems, reflections by members of the Hindu um, uh, Hindu Samaj um, community in Sheffield, and it makes very interesting reading in terms of their perspective on the Industrial Revolution in, uh, in Britain. So how can we move forward? Um, and I was, well, I've got three bullet points, but I've come up with a fourth after, after yesterday's uh, climate change session that I was at. Um, I think we, my feeling is that we can foster the development of international research frameworks, and we can follow the lead of 
volumes such as this, the North Sea um, uh, joint framework, and um, which, which of course enabled a cr crucial collaboration in terms of understanding the development of, um, of Doggerland, that now submerged block of mainland, uh, mainland Europe, um, which was um, uh, which is a crucial repository of, of information, both environment, environmental and archaeological, about the development of Mesolithic Europe. We can also, second point, support the development of updatable digital resources. And we will come on to discussion this afternoon about the, the common digital platform, which is being developed in, in, in the UK. Um, and of course, it goes need, it's needless to say that any, any digital framework which is web-based is, is therefore accessible globally, which helps. Um, we can also encourage projects with an international focus um, that investigate questions embedded in national or regional research frameworks. And I give one example here, um, the site um, with the rather well, sort of curious acronym of Profigo, which I was, which I was involved in. It's one of these um, Horizon 2020 um, projects, and it basically was studying the impacts of geohazards and climate change upon European World Heritage Sites. So the canvas was the entirety of Europe and the total population of World Heritage Sites, and it was based on four case studies, um, Roman Forum, the Alhambra of Spain, um, a near settlement in, in Cyprus, and the most exciting of all, the emails of World Heritage Site. <laughs> so we were an illustrious company, and, and the Roman Valley Cruises were filmed to be twinned with the Alhambra and Rome and, and the Roman Forum. Maybe just, just where they should be. Um, so that's the sort of thing which I think should be encouraged. Um, and one final point which um, occurred to me very forcibly yesterday, I went to a climate change session, which lasted the which was a whole day session, and, and there was a workshop at the end of it. And one of the um, one of the actions of this, this group has been to establish a, a community um, with, the, with the EAA, um, basically, um, I don't know how you just, an interest group, I suppose, um, called the Climate Change and Heritage Group. And there are about a dozen of those on the, web, on the EAA website, if you um, search them, which I did this morning. Um, and um, I wonder whether it's worth considering today whether we would like to think about a research framework community group, um, because that provides a European platform for this activity. Um, the Climate Change and Heritage Group provides it as a platform for um, posting reports, publication, news on events, and they're paralleling a big splash in, in Bern in a year's time. And um, so that all, that all fixed together, I think, in a way, as a, as a method for communicating research frameworks to people, disseminating that, and encouraging their, um, their application. So that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you.